many times in the library, and we're also thrilled that Laura was at the Futures Conference that always organized in June, and had a lot to say about education and, and what's going on in, in that arena for um, moving towards the future. So thank you to everyone, and thank you to Miguel, who's going to get us started. Okay, so hopefully this is, yes, we're getting sound. Okay, so let me tell you my big sigh of relief, I guess, when I came to Providence Community Library. Most people start out this conversation with, so you're going to tell us the future of libraries. And I was so pleased when I looked at the back of the annual report because you have this great statement that says everyone in Providence has a library. And I think that reinforces not only the idea of what you built over the past nine years, but you created nine distinct libraries that are reflective of very diverse neighborhoods across the city. But I think it also speaks to the future vision that you all have, that there isn't a single idea about what the future of the library may be, that it is in fact driven by community needs and it varies from library to library based on how that community works with the library staff, um, based on how it works with community leaders like our library boards and friends groups and other organizations. So I think most of your work is done. You know that the future of libraries is diverse. It's going to change. It's not a cookie cutter model for everyone else. Um, but I think there's a couple of things that are common across thinking about the future of libraries. And one of them is that there was a time when the social, government, economic, and technological order allowed institutions to sort of create sustained systems and structures into which users would fall into an expected mode of use. So there was this defining idea for a library that they would build a collection, explain to users how they use that collection, and then expect that the users would fall into line with how the library can work. We just had to figure out the ways to fit the user into our concept of what a library would be. We would build it and they would come and use it in the way that we created it. And I think over the past several years, through changes in technologies, education, social habits, economic needs, and environmental priorities, those have all contributed to a disruption of our normal order, not only in libraries, but across society. And so the world seems to be changing faster than it has before, or maybe it's just that those changes are more distributed and accessible to most of us, so that they're observable. But it's really forced a lot of institutions to adapt to the new realities of our users or suffer a fate of irrelevance. And I think for most libraries, they are starting to shift their thinking to, to mean that they need to re-examine their work and value from the perspective of how we fit into the changing needs of users. So how does the library fit into the life of the user, and how do we continuously update and modernize our services so that we're reflecting of the change, reflective of the change in reality for our community. So the question then becomes, what are some of the major areas of change that we have to consider? I think a lot of these remain very similar to the basic concept of libraries, but there are new trends and changes that we can observe. Um, Dana Boyd of the Data and Society Institute notes that there is a cultural change in how we make sense of information, whom we trust, and how we understand our own role in grappling with information. And I think information is fundamentally changing. Um, from a world of information scarcity, we are now in a world of information proliferation. The traditional containers for information, I think, are changing. And at the same time, new and easier ways of accessing that information are challenging our concepts of authority and truth. Even as we're starting to see a lot of platforms and systems make information available in all of its forms, we're starting to see a lot of unique innovations and changes in how people access that information. Um, one of them is this movement towards short reading. And I think a lot of us think that we're digesting information in shorter and shorter chunks, thanks in large part to social media and other platforms that kind of overwhelm us with snippets of information that we can quickly access on our mobile devices and absorb and share on Facebook or Twitter or any other platform. But even if digital technologies are moving us towards shorter reading, I think a lot of other systems are as well. One of the examples I usually point to is this little thing called short edition. It's a short story dispenser that basically community users can go up to, and they can indicate that they have one minute to read, three minutes to read, five minutes or 10 minutes, and it dispenses a little register receipt tape that allows them to read just enough to fill that little gap of time. The innovators kind of pose this as the antithesis to social media reading. If you're at a bus stop or a train station, you might pull out your phone and mindlessly scroll through Facebook or Twitter. They do do it intentionally and meaningfully, but at some point it also becomes somewhat mindless. Um, but Short Edition thought, what if instead of that, we deposited these little kiosks at gathering or transportation places so that people can have a real connection and a physical object to focus their attention on? We're 
we're starting to see a lot of voice control technologies that are taking advantage of natural language processing, machine learning systems. Um, we've all used Alexa, Siri, or Google Assistant to ask for any one of a number of informational items when a movie might be starting, directions to a particular place. Maybe we just want to settle a dispute between kids about the capital of Rhode Island. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, even as we appreciate how accessible these information sources are, a lot of us are struggling to understand the basic systems and platforms that provide that information to Alexa and Siri. It isn't Alexa or Siri that's providing the response back. It's the platform that Alexa or Siri pulls from, and it's also a combination of their understanding of the question that was asked or posed, and how quickly they can understand that predict and predict what you're actually, what information you're actually consuming. We're seeing toy makers transform the nature of play by viewing inanimate objects with connectivity to wireless networks that can allow them to become more animated and quickly access information over Wi-Fi or other networks. So this little device called Toby allows parents to provide a toy that can relay a story to their child and then track the child's acquisition of the lessons from that story over Wi-Fi network and create a system of conclusions so that the parent is notified on their mobile device or app that their child has heard a story about bullying or sibling rivalry or something else. And of course, and exemplified on our wall, we're seeing no shortage of immersion into virtual reality. What we always thought would become these immersive environments for entertainment and gaming have become basically information portals so that people can access information about news, new perspectives about different uh, locations, places, experiences, and it really is much more about the informational transfer rather than just we're starting to see massive changes in education, a growing recognition of the types of skills and knowledge that we acquire in lots of different spaces and capacities across the whole lifespan of knowledge. We've seen education innovators move towards credentialing and badging so that individuals can recognize formal and informal learning opportunities that happen in classes, but maybe even things that we learn at the Parks and Recreation Department, at a museum, at a library, that have real world value if we can digitize the recognition of those lessons and learning, then individuals can manage their arc of knowledge throughout their lifetime by acquiring and creating credentials and properties of that. The proliferation of uh, digital and electronic information allows people to access learning wherever they are. And even as we see the availability of open online courses and other types of educational content online, our learning experiences with that have reinforced the importance of socialization. So these individuals are actually at Chicago Public Library, and they've elected as a group, they were brought together by a library staff member to all take a massive open online course together. And the library staff member helps to facilitate that learning process. They all listen to and watch the video recordings for that online course individually at their own home. But then they commit to coming to the public library once a week, or maybe every other week, to talk together about what they just learned. And maybe they take their quizzes together. Or maybe they just process and help unpack some of the questions that they have. And the library staff member learns with them and helps to create that sort of guiding force towards completion. Because access doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to use all of the information that's required. And of course, as we'll hear, um, a lot of movement towards self-directed, experiential, and hands-on learning in a maker movement or this movement towards design thinking. That people should orient themselves to be hands-on and try and solve problems through the learning process. And we see this movement towards robotics and other types of technology acquisition, but also this idea that the math and science and engineering of sewing or knitting or any other type of hands-on activity is educational and beneficial for communities. The ways that people are accessing and discovering information and resources is also changing. We're going to start to see this growing movement towards drones and robots as a means of delivering materials and items across the community. I think most of us are uh, enamored or enchanted by this idea of Amazon having drones to deliver things to our doorstep. But as we're waiting for all the regulation around drones, a firm called Starship Technologies has slowly but surely pushed legalization in several states to have their motorized robots legalized on sidewalks and crosswalks across uh, uh, Idaho and Maryland and Virginia. And so food distributors or even retail locations can pack items that people order into that device and it wheels its way across the community and the recipient types in an access code and opens the lid and puts out what they want. We could easily see this as a means for book delivery. These subscription kits that everyone seems to want not only market themselves in 
this idea of convenience that something's delivered directly to your door, but ultimately they also reinforce the idea that some expert curator can help me help expose me to a new idea or thought that I hadn't had before. I may not be an expert in cooking, but I can trust the people of my meal kit service to put all of the ingredients together with easy to read instructions so that I can have a filling experience in my kitchen and feel some amount of expertise. We can easily imagine that idea transferring to libraries, where expert library staff put together not only the books and other resources, but maybe a little bit of equipment or something else to make you experience the mastery of a particular skill in the convenience of your home. And also start to form a relationship of the things that you're interested in, how they can surprise you with the next step in your evolutionary process. And of course, we see the sharing economy transforming the ways and the range of things that people borrow and access. A ride in a car, a tool, maybe even a meal on a platform like mealsharing.com where you can find out and discover your neighbor is cooking uh, something at their home and decide I'm going to go and visit them in their house. Um, <laughs> it happens. Uh, the strange thing is, is that much more is less about what you can actually access and much more about the experience of sharing. You're not just going into their home to be fed, you're going into their home so that you get to meet your neighbor, neighbor maybe have that sort of experience and bonding around the meal that we don't always have the opportunity to do. And certainly even in our services, you start to see who's in proximity to you, where you are in the borrowing process, so you have an exact idea of when your car is coming, the picture of your driver, and even a reputation awareness of how good are they, you know, do they have four stars or five stars or something like that? How will that change uh, the nature of sharing? The nature of partnerships and collaboration is changing in a lot of big ways. Communities are tackling big, persistent issues, hunger, poverty, education, through collective impact models that carefully and intentionally bring together the best elements of various partners into coordinated efforts that drive results. That image on the left is a library in Ohio, and it was profiled in the New York Times about how summer library programs are integrating food service programs, especially for young children, who uh, suffer, suffer from food scarcity over the summer months when they may not be able to access a summer lunch, uh, a lunch program at their school. And it's not that the library is providing meals, it's that the library recognized that this is an issue that they are committed to, and they partnered with a food bank or other food distribution agency and said, we don't have expertise in providing meals, but we know that we're a trusted space in our community where people will come and have access to and so they're doing that in the best way that they can. We're also seeing smart city and smart community development, wherein organizations across the city or community are recognizing that the way that they collect, use, and exchange data can create better outcomes for citizens. No matter how they're remixed or repurposed, if we know better about how our communities work and function based on data, we can start to do more predictive and delightful services for users across areas. And then lastly, we're starting to see a lot of uh, communities look at their economic and long-term vitality as dependent on the, their cultural assets working together. Um, more and more cities in the Rust Belt and other economically depressed ideas are recognizing that if they want to have a long-term future, they need to bring together the assets of higher education, cultural institutions, and creative communities. More often than not, museums, libraries, and other sort of innovation hubs and create these sort of shared spaces that percolate new ideas for the economy, but also, and more importantly, bring different people together into conversations into shared spaces. And that brings us to spaces, I think. Um, our ideas of public space are changing rapidly, and I think this is one of the most important ideas, especially for a branch or a network of neighborhood libraries and pubs to uh, serve and keep track of. We're starting to see the most popular restaurants have become social spaces. They invest in flexible furniture, free and accessible technology, um, well-designed furnishings and uh, lighting, and seamless ordering experiences. Customers use these spaces not just to dine, but to work, socialize, and relax. Just think of Starbucks. Uh, this image is from Sweet Green, but you can easily think of Chipotle, Panera, and any of those other places that have lured you to bring in your laptop at the same time that you're ordering your food. <laughs> Retail is moving in much the same direction. Um, we start to see Apple moving towards Apple Town Square ideas, where they're not just engaged in the transaction of your purchasing an object, they're really trying to create a long-term brand affinity by making their spaces all about learning and all about experience. You can take your existing Apple device back to the Apple Store and they will show you how to use it in new and different ways, even if you don't buy directly from them. Um, they're now investing in lectures 
actors and musical performance and other ideas. They want to develop a sort of strong brand affinity. So you want to feel compelled to be part of their culture, the culture of Apple. Uh, Sephora, the beauty brand, is investing in a tip store concept, teach, inspire, play. They're far less concerned about buying a lipstick. They're much more concerned about coming into their space, learning as a group, and going back to feeling good about yourself because they know that will bring you back into their retail space. Co-working and co-living spaces are starting to invest in not only bringing people together in shared spaces, but really the value proposition of professional staff that intermix across the participants in a co-working space and cross-pollinate ideas. People want not just well-appointed spaces, they also want the social network that they can provide. That's a very different proposition from what we typically think of in an office. They really want that sort of internet. And creative placemaking is looking at the elements of design and art to create public conversations about some of the things that we typically encounter in our day-to-day -day service. This bus stop in Baltimore is certainly a bus stop, but it's also a community conversation art piece, and for the moment, it's a great playground for these two children. And it may not be what you typically think about from a city service or a city bus stop, but it certainly creates that sense of pride and the unexpected and the delightful. Um, and other pictures of this show older adults from the community gathering at their central point of coffee conversation and news discussion. Um, but you can see the man in the foreground, he's just waiting for the bus. So <laughs> it works for lots of different purposes. <laughs> Um, what libraries do with all of these changes and trends has everything to do with our values. Uh, while the world has changed, I think library values remain very much the same. We're committed to access, to specific commons, to creation and expression, to democracy, discovery, diversity, education, intellectual freedom, literacy, a sense of place, providing that sense of pleasure, preservation, public discourse, and trust. I think any library can absorb today's trends and changes. But, like we've, and we've done that for a long time, we've absorbed lots of different trends and changes. But so long as we remain committed to these values, I think there will always be a future for libraries. We're not blindly chasing after trends. We're trying to find the meaningful ends towards these very important values that are timeless and uh, generation. So, the central challenges we have as organizations within our communities is to recognize which of the trends are most important to our users right now and which of the trends we can use to our beneficial advantage to advance these particular values. When we do that, we create libraries that are meaningful for every community. So, thank you all very much. Let's have any questions or discussion before we move to our panel. We need a great start. <laughs> Well, I think any one of these could be mean, used meaningfully if we decide to use them towards our particular values. So we, the thing that we don't want to do, and perhaps I'll give a, an example, is we can see a trend out in the world and say, well, everybody's talking about 3D printing. And it's a trend, you know, that sort of uh, uh, construction of objects using technology and this sort of self-determination around it. But unless we find a meaningful application of it within the library, we're going to struggle with it. Um, I, I was on a trip, and uh, I won't say what city, but I was going to I was on a trip, <laughs> and I was in a taxi, and I was talking to the taxi driver about what I do, and I said, oh, I'm a librarian. And he quickly launched into his concern because his library had acquired a 3D printer. And he said, they bought it simply because everybody was talking about it. And he said, and then they put it behind a desk and didn't let anybody use it. It just became a point on their tour of the library. And I said, well, that's really interesting. I said, I think a lot of other libraries are invested in 3D printers not because they're what everybody's talking about, but because they've made that trend meaningful to their pursuit of creation and expression and intellectual curiosity. And they've made it a space where people can gather around and talk through their problems and use it as a means of developing something new in the same way that they went to books and tried to find new knowledge. They can go to the 3D printer and try to create a new object and a new process. So it is about using those uh, trends of specific means that resonate with what we want to So one of the things that strikes me 
hearing you talk is thinking of libraries as civic commons in places that are um, separate from sort of profit-driven businesses that are often trying to capture our attention and then drive it towards purchasing and consuming. And I'm wondering, as I'm looking at the really cool stuff that are that's also trendy, how we about, like, how does a library maintain that civic commons principle in the face of changes that seem to have every angle kind of coming at you to market to you? Um, so I think we're in a moment, especially given some of the changes that Starbucks has announced and other places, that they are actually starting to use that third space language to a lot of their marketing and positioning to say that they're public and open to everyone. And I think you're right. Ultimately, they are public and open to everyone to support their bottom line. That, that's what they're there for. I mean, I think that, that's not uh, to disparage that pursuit to say that it's different from what we do. Um, I think the challenge that we have as libraries is to use that civic commons for meaningful discourse and discussion. It isn't simply about bringing people together into a shared space. We don't want them together alone, meaning that everyone's working on their individual and local pursuits, which often happen within a Starbucks. We see that people are, yes, they're all together in a common space, but they're focused on their isolated pursuits. The value of the civic commons is to engage in that discourse meaningfully so that people get to know their neighbors and start to um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that libraries are one of the last outposts to actually provide this type of intermixing and facilitation to some of our more intentional programs. Um, story time especially is one of those things where every parent or guardian brings their child to story time, no matter their you know, educational or economic background, it's meaningful engagement around things. It's the way that they start to model parenting. Um, we need to find more of those types of activities that people can start to talk about the things that they truly want and we can start to bring in some of the new trends or things that people are actually most interested in and show them how they, how they can be used in their life. I saw some, a story about um, like weed bowling for seniors in yeah. a library space and I thought that was really cool. Bring people who would, you know, are, mm -hmm. aren't able to bowl in a bowling alley anymore and have them do video and, games together. And the very cool thing is when it's bowling for seniors and also their grandchildren. Their kids, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then it truly becomes that sort of civic commons bringing people together from a very different perspective. And the game, the ultimate goal isn't to play the game. Yeah. The ultimate goal is to get together. I think that what you're saying is true, but it's also true in Tom Library. It's lost to the discussion time. There are a lot of people, particularly people who are sort of in perspective, who do go to libraries because they want quiet experiences Absolutely. by themselves and uh, want to pursue things without having necessarily a social experience. Absolutely. So I don't think, I think we have to maintain a balance between those two pursuits. Definitely. And I think one of the interesting things as we look at trends is also recognizing that they're sort of anti trends at the same time along a similar spectrum. And so while everyone seems to be pursuing this path towards connectivity and surrounding themselves with technology, we're starting to see a lot of people swing the other way and recognize the value of unplugging or pursuing a digital detox, whatever it may be. Um, and we may want to figure out ways where we perhaps allocate space or time in the library schedule to accommodate those services and needs and become useful. Um, and our academic library colleagues, I think, are starting to recognize that if you go to an academic library during finals week, you will see this is a much more unplugged, focused space, but then in the regular semester, it's a social and space. <coughs> for some people, for me, an art museum, concert hall, a library, is a place where I can get some respite from the, the world as it's buzzing all around me. Absolutely. So I think that that, that, that quality has to be the same as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just follow up with the
strangely a shift for some of our values because some of what people value in the library is taken for some very interest private. It's, it's not part of a public pursuit. But co working kind of lifts a little bit of that because they do want somebody who's kind of cross pollinating and getting into your business and sharing it with other people. Um, so we have to figure out how to do that in sort of contained spaces or structured programs so that we balance across those different values. The, uh, Here are here. I know there are a lot of board members. 
from the library, and uh, it's so important to have engaged volunteers. Uh, and I want to thank Cheryl and her staff and all the librarians for the uh, participating in this journey we've been on since uh, January 1st, but actually began in about November of last year. So it's been quite a ride. We've all learned a lot uh, working together. So Fab Newport, at the very most basic level, we inspire kids to grow their skills so they can gain confidence. And when they have the confidence, they can begin to bring their dreams to life. And, uh, and how do we do that? We bring them in to the lab where we work in schools, and they see machines, they see sewing machines, laser cutters, vinyl cutters, straws, pipe cleaners, tape. And we sometimes will say something as simple as make something that wiggles. They look at you for a minute or two, and then boom, they're on their way. And we take seriously and engage in where each child is at their particular moment in time. We have destinations where we'd like them to arrive, whether it's becoming a sophisticated coder or a industrial certified 3D designer or a sewer of a bag that they might want to sell, but we realize that every human being is on a journey that is yet determined if you're a 12 year old, but we know that every child is born with something that's alive and wants to come to life in its own particular way. And we work both, mostly with underserved kids. Our programs run in some schools. We have a vigorous after-school program in Newport. We work with high school kids who take advanced places in computer science class. We have a 3D design class that we now call Design, Make, Manufacture. And we're working in all the libraries here down in Providence. And look, I honestly believe that schools stay the same in 20 years that we're all going to be in trouble. That no kids love to learn, but a lot of kids get squashed. So what we're working on, I was over at Highlander earlier today talking about with Nick and B, whose name I want to begin to pronounce. Um, and we've developed a platform where kids can design their own pathways collect their experiences and portfolios and begin to articulate the journey that they want to take. Because there are a lot of people out there in the world telling you, if you're a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old or 18-year-old, what you should do. But if we create conditions where kids can flower and blossom, we want to encourage them to develop their portfolios, develop their ideas. We want them to knock on your door and say, this looks like Cool place. I want to work for you. And I say, wow, this kid's really interesting. You say, what can you do? And then that child might say, well, let me show you my portfolio. This is what, this is the one I want to do. So we're excited to be here. Thank you. So I would uh, uh, love to start by telling a story, um, and just so I get a chance. Uh, understand the audience, how many of you um, are recommending books to people every day? Saying, I'm interested in dinosaurs. <laughs> so I've had the distinct pleasure of having a uh, chance to introduce virtual reality of the reality of those tools in my work. I wanted to share a story. And if you remember, um, just in August, we were introducing um, the technology with the Oculus Ghost to the Providence Community Library. Um, at, at, and we had an older gentleman tell us, so I always ask the question what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? That This older gentleman said, my son just went to Italy, went to this town, it's our ancestral town, and never going to have a chance to go. I'd like to go. And wouldn't you 
you know, between the middle of my talk and the end, I found two 360 videos. This is what those dogs are on. And look over the town. That's the dinosaur moment, right? When the child gets that phone and asks, Yes! <laughs> <laughs> So 
On the other side, we have children that are really interested in this technology and how do you create for it? So he took those children, created 360 videos of animal encounters at the zoo, made those encounters available during the summer reading programs so that the children that couldn't go to the zoo could use those experiences and get the stamp. So I think that's a really um, great example of using the technology uh, with the mission and values of the So I think the table will keep uh, down with that end of the table. But my question is, like, what is a bold vision for the province community library? We could do anything in any direction. What would we do? So I have three answers. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no hows, so just kind of like, you know, pop them out there, what ifs. Because right. I, I think I, I could go hours with all of you guys about on the universities. One, to be a leader in providing equal access to technology. I think that's a big one nowadays for children, especially. Um, two, to be the leader in providing equal access to experiences. So not only equal access to knowledge, but equal access to experiences. What does that mean? <laughs> to be the keeper of spaces. So we're keepers of knowledge at libraries. What does it mean to be keeper of spaces and experience? So this building wasn't looking like this 50 years ago, 100 years ago. What did it look like? So 100 years ago, people took photographs. Now we could use that device to create experiences. What if libraries were the place where you could get access to that? Um, well, when I was thinking about that question, I went back to what I started talking about, this idea of, sort of breaking out of the school building. So, um, you know, I think there will always be an important physical structure that is school, and there's a lot to gain from having a place where people gather and know as their school building. Um, but I really love this idea of sort of making the city the campus and harnessing the resources of the city as part of a school's campus. Um, so I don't know how bold it is, because I think it's being done to some extent, but I would like to um, further this, this idea of, especially at the secondary level, making libraries one of the informal learning spaces where secondary students can be out in the city, maybe spending time doing a project out with a community partner, then working sort of independently or with a small group or with a mentor at a library space, and then going back to their school building in the afternoon to do more traditional coursework or the reverse. Um, so I really think libraries are kind of straddling that middle space. I was looking at your slides there, you know, thinking of Starbucks, Apple, and I think space is critical because even the libraries themselves are still very, you know, they're stained, very concrete brick buildings. And so the movement of people, like all those ideas that you have up there, they're all connected, they're not separate. So how do we, like, how does something so exciting going on even in the library's you know, outdoor space, which Rochambeau actually has a very nice outdoor space, how does that space become playful, engaging, a place of learning, and how does that draw people in? And so, you know, I mean, Apple has, you know, four billion dollars in any companies in the world. So how do we garner that kind of investment in the library? So. I think the boldest, my boldest vision is to re-engage uh, you know, civic leaders, uh, private leaders, and recognize that leaders, that libraries can take the lead in creating the most dynamic, integrated, free learning environments possible. Right here in the province, every library is about 0.9 How could each library be this special, amazing thing that a kid over here, because they learned how to ride their bike, that they've done it with their parents or their folks, or the next library, which takes them into a whole new neighborhood, and a whole 
whole experience. And all of a sudden, by the time you're 12 or 13 years old, you want to go out and seek your independence. And when as, you know, elementary school, you know, there's a lot of great things going on there. But when you're 10 or 11 or 12 or 13, you want to go out and see what's going on in the world. So let's encourage the kids to go out and see what's going on in the world. But the point is, you have to be the perfect place to develop these third species or whatever. Yeah, there's a time where um, it would be, it would almost be great if it just the last part of the views, like the terrarium, so everybody <laughs> has to be like, that's happening in there. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, it's true. Um, so, what are some of the big opportunities that this community has built for it, and how does the Proper Community Library provide a platform for that opportunity? What are some of the great I don't know all the untold assets. I have been to a number of basements now that uh, so, and, uh, I haven't been to any rooftops yet, but I've been in a lot of kitchens and I've found bathrooms in places that I didn't expect to find. Uh, actually, those are an asset in, uh, in cities, we go to that. Uh, but the work that we're trying to do is, again, through a platform where we know kids are learning things every day, is to give them a place where they can their experiences and then curate them in a way that makes sense to them and to their families and then they communicate that with their teachers, potential employers, and their peers. So it's all the people in the libraries. We've got, like, you know, I don't know how many, there's, I think 54 librarians, but there's hundreds of librarians ready to engage in doing this work. So there it is. Hundreds of young people that are emerging experts. is what I was going to talk about. So I am actually woefully unfamiliar with the work of the community libraries in Providence. I'm say we live in the city, and our organization has not done a lot of formal work with the community libraries, but um, work very closely with the school department. And I think that's a huge asset of the city because Providence Public Schools have been really uh, at the forefront of this work that I talked about in terms of blended and personalized learning. Their district leadership um, and school leaders around the city have really welcomed us with open arms and been willing to try new models, um, play around with what classrooms look like, with what instruction looks like, um, try new platforms, um, new tools. So I think they can be a phenomenal partner for library leaders um, who want to create these tighter connections or to strengthen the connections between the schools and the libraries um, because they really are very forward thinking and willing to experiment. Um, and, so, uh, and then similarly, you have teachers in the city who day in and day out are willing to try new things by necessity. Um, and so they are often looking for partners. So if you have an idea, I, I don't think it would be hard to find a teacher in the city who would be willing to partner with you and say, I'd like to try that or you know, let's, let's create some programming together for my course that I'm teaching. Um, so that's a huge asset. And then the, the students of Providence, like one of the ways I was thinking um, in the example you were getting was activating young people as teachers uh, in community spaces. So my grandpa's girlfriend approached me and she said, how would I learn how to use some of this new technology? And she's like, I don't want to go to the Apple store. I went there once. It was intimidating. But like, where else could I go? And I'm like, the library? But I wasn't sure. And thought, you know, that's something that the library does not have to staff themselves, that there are young people for whom this is second nature, um, and who would also benefit quite a bit from the experience of being the teacher and being the expert and getting to kind of share what they know. Um, so that's just, you know, a small example, but I think there are, there is a lot of untapped potential among the students themselves. Right. Which we do in school. Yeah. All the time. You, have to, you tell teachers just like embrace that you don't know it and ask them to help you. They'll figure it out faster than you do. And then in fact, I'm gonna go completely on the VR and say that PCL already does this. Um, they've had and those of you who are a part of the PCL programming 
know about the computer building um, program that David so did. And I just think it's one of those things that just hits all of the library values. It's the kids learning how to build computers that the library needs and uses. And it has their name on it, so it's doing ownership. Um, it is um, creating uh, agency. It's um, a great asset that um, the Providence Community Library, I think it is forming. It's just this experiment. Um, and so I think we have an amazing tradition at Providence Community Library of experimentation with programming. Um, I would say that it isn't just um, those computers, which, <laughs> hey, so much fun, what can I do? Hey, I can make both something that I can, you know, have the community be involved in building, you know, lower the cost, and I have something to use afterwards. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, win, 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 all right. Um, but I'm constantly surprised um, and delighted by how involved the community is with the um, community library programming from dancing, story times to um, the other day I was at Rochambeau with some NASA scientists um, uh, with librarians talking about how that subject matter and the resources that they have um, could be used in libraries. So yes, go to the library. Yes, I think one of the things we have a, the biggest resource in DCL is the library, are the libraries, <laughs> and uh, not my first language, and, um, <laughs> so and, uh, uh, the and and so that actually gets me on my little soapbox, but I am uh, running a uh, September 26th library workshop to take uh, everyone through all of the different types of VR technology, but also with the goal of making you, you know, you smart enough so when that 12 year old comes up to you and says, I heard about VR, you know, you have that, those couple of books in your library, but you also have enough um, to be able to, to, to get that child to try something or to go somewhere or, you know, read the book, etc. So, um, I think the PCL platform and it's experimentation of what the library of the future is and what that program is. And every one of those non-libraries has a different flavor and has a different customer and nobody knows them better than the people that are working for them today. So you know, when I talk to PCL folks about, you know, well, we could do this, you know, there are certain libraries they know where that type of this will work. Others. But then we try it, and then sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think that's a leadership position that we see in the thing. So, since we are a stage for participation, are there any questions from audience <coughs> the Yeah. 
who have these amazing resources but don't have enough people utilizing them, you know, just have, reach out and have a conversation to start thinking about ways in which you can partner uh, more formally. But again, I don't want to offend people who say we are already doing that. I, I'm not um, extremely well versed in that. <laughs> so that I think the boring answer is, is I think there's lots of opportunity on, on my part. Um, the studio road uh, grants are the, you know, the write-ups are coming out. I'm doing this workshop on the September 26, and I'm really wanting to engage the libraries and in Rhode Island and PCL specifically around what we can do as a state to be at the forefront. So much of what I love about library is uh, physical restorative space. So. I think the public in public libraries needs to be emphasized sometimes to make a lot of this happen. It can't just be citizens going up and demanding a certain service or something else. It has to be forming that coalition of interested individuals that can say, I can contribute my expertise in working with young people or my connections to schools and my particular path to virtual reality and bring together Thank you. 
said go, we talked about we didn't see talked about, we didn't tell and talk about share. And um, one of the things that I get to do when we talk about uh, virtual reality and authentic reality, making content is we get to imagine. And so um, I have a couple of slides that I usually put up to help you. So um, a lot of people have some favorite movies, either magical movies like Harry Potter or futuristic movies like hero movies. Um, and a lot of them use things that we can do, we can already make happen in the virtual reality. Like the pencil, the Harry Potter, the cord, the most memory, happy memories. And then you can like, Go into a virtual world and pick out and go to share a memory with someone, right? Okay, so think about your favorite movie, futuristic or magical. And then as you go through your interactions with the library, whether it's online, you're going to an event or a program, you're reading an ebook, you're reading a little paper book, you're sharing a book with a child, what would that be? And if you think of something really cool, share. So I would absolutely agree. Go to your library, meet some people, because there are the really cool things in libraries. And if you have cool ideas, share. Bring us back to our share. You know, I'm almost sad that Terry Hassel isn't here because uh, last year around this time, we were in a meeting and I was like, why are you yelling? And I actually have a loud voice. 